Welcome to the X-Man Podcast. I am your host, Doc Coyle. It's been about a month since the last episode of the X-Men, and for that, I would like to apologize to all the listeners who've been waiting for a new episode. It's uh, The delay has been for a few reasons. First off, I did a little mini tour with my band Vegas Nerve in California the week of the NAM conference, and that took up around two weeks between the time before the tour and kind of decompressing afterward. It was a lot of fun, but it was also a lot of work. And one other issue why it's been so long between episodes is my interface, actually my Apogee Duet had to go into the shop to get some repairs done. So that set me back a little bit and also just had some scheduling conflicts with potential guests where I was supposed to talk to someone and we couldn't meet up or people canceled. So that ended up delaying a couple episodes and which might actually lead me to start doing some more Skype podcasts or phoners, which I prefer not to do. I like the the personal connection of talking to people face to face. But at the end of the day, it's about getting consistent content and talking to people. And even though I'm in LA and there are a lot of musicians here, there are a lot of people who aren't here. So I'll be looking into doing that more just just to really keep everything really consistent with the show. And not to backtrack too much, but I kind of want to talk about the, the Vegas Nerve Tour for a second. Uh, it was really awesome, actually. I, I hadn't Really, I haven't toured since the beginning of the year when I when I was playing with the band May Tall and we opened for Queensryche. And this tour, it was it was very small. We were doing smaller venues, um, you know, almost purposely not trying to make a huge deal out of it because the band is is so new. It was almost like a a trial run, and I can't believe how good the band sounded. And I know coming from me, I'm in the band, so clearly I have some bias in that regard, but it really is a testament to to the musicians in in the band and, and how well prepared they are and how professionally they uh they approach their their instruments and also a testament to kind of the chemistry of a band. And it's part of the reason why Vegas Nerve, I have three guys between New York, Pennsylvania and uh new jersey and i have my bass player lives in oregon and why i actually want to do the band even though it's long distance because we just have chemistry and that's something that is hard to find and when you do find it you try and keep it together so i just want to uh thank all those guys for coming out here um also want to thank uh, my girlfriend jasmine for putting the guys up selling merch for us uh everyone who helped us with the shows that was awesome we are looking into doing some more shows. We actually possibly have a potential tour in the works, but it is not confirmed. And I will definitely unleash that information when it becomes available. And we actually also shot a music video on the tour, like a live style video for a song called Promise Me the World. Our buddy Carlos Almonte uh, shot that. So hopefully that'll be coming out in the next a month, month or two. And since the tour wrapped up, you know, I've, I've kind of found a difficult time getting back to a normalcy of balance. I, I like to think of myself as someone who is good at multitasking, but it's just not true. <laughs> I, uh, I kind of have to work on one thing at a time. Like for example, last night I played at the ultimate jam night in Hollywood and I had to learn you know, a few songs, one by Metallica, uh, an Evanescence song, and a Foo Fighters song, The Pretender, which I already knew. But I pretty much had to just spend a d- one day just doing that. You know, I can't really jump around and do 50 things. But when you're someone like me who does a little bit of everything, that becomes difficult. So I'd say maybe even as something I'm not even telling you guys, but I'm almost telling myself is trying to, you know, one intention I want to put out there is is to try and find more balance. And, you know, when you're doing a lot of things, you know, you have to be careful not to stretch yourself 
too thin. So that's going to say it on here, but as a little reminder to myself. Well, enough about me. Let's talk about this week's sponsor. We have a band called Firefly Atlas, and they're from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, they have a new EP called Of Ghosts, and you can find this EP on their website, fireflyatlas.com, which actually links you to their band camp, and you can stream the music there, you can purchase the music, and you can also stream the music on pretty much any popular streaming service, be it Apple Music or Spotify, etc. And we're going to play this song, and it's called Of Dirt. Crazy. 
breathe, feel it inside, breathe, uncertainty, breathe, embrace your life. That was the song Of Dirt from the Of Ghosts EP from the band Firefly Atlas. I really want to thank them for sponsoring the show. And if you are interested in sponsoring the X-Men podcast, please hit me up on social media. I am pretty easy to find. And without further ado, let's get to our guest for this episode, Mr. Bill Hudson. If you are not familiar with him, he's one of the probably one of the best heavy metal guitar players working today. He's a true professional. His resume is about as prolific as I've seen. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you all the bands he's either played with, written written with, recorded, uh toured with, uh, you know, it's it's kind of different with everything. But I'm going to give you this list and, you know, I might need to uh, come up for air, but let's let's go. So, uh Celador, Avian or Avian not sure. Power Quest, Echo Terra, Infernion, Circle to Circle, John Oliva's Pain, Sabotage, Stardust Reverie Project, Vital Remains, Westfield Massacre, Cobra and the Lotus, currently Tri- Trans Siberian Orchestra, and I Am Morbid. And he's also contributed to uh, Once Humans first record and the Metal Gear Rising Revengeance soundtrack. So yeah, I mean, that's only some of it. I mean, this guy is just constantly working and it just goes to show you, you know, that uh, you can make a living doing music uh, on, on a professional level. And that's that's what this show is about, uh, bringing these people out of light and having them tell their stories. And Bill, he's just a, he's just a cool guy and really great to talk with. I, I love how honest he is and, and open and and even with with this conversation, I think we barely got to everything. And I think with when you have someone with a career so extensive, you're not going to get to everything unless you're going to have a three hour Joe Rogan style podcast. But uh, I'm going to stop running my mouth and let's get to talking to Bill. So here we are. We're at this is the X Men. We got a real a real X Men. X Men things on the show. <laughs> I was researching our guest today, Mr. Bill Hudson, and I don't think I've ever like let alone people have been on this show. I don't know people that have been in as, as many bands as you've been in. Or I don't even know if been in bands. Are you you know because it's it seems like you're the type of guy where you do like lots of. Are you doing like just songwriting or recording, but you're not in the band? Yeah, a lot of the time that's what happens. A lot of touring too, you know, yeah. like like uh, a lot of bands I do a tour or two and I and and you know it doesn't work any further. The thing is, um, for me, the whole like being in one band thing has never worked. You know, I'm trying to do that right now. To be honest, you know, I'm trying with, to with, with which band? No, I'm trying to start a new one, one that would be my band. You know, like my music and all that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've written for quite a few people, and and it seems like it seems like at the end it never works out uh, 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 as far as schedule goes and all that. Because over the years I started getting more, you know, paid offers, and yeah. Yeah, at the end of the day you you gotta kind of follow the money in this industry, you know. Gotta follow the money. <laughs> you, well, you, you I, I I say this: most of us aren't as uh, good as you, where we can just where there are people actually offering us money. <laughs> most I, I always say this when it comes to music: you have the biggest portion of people who are doing it where they're literally paying money to yeah. be in a band. You know where they're fronting all the expenses. Then you have the people who are just breaking even, and then you have people yeah. making money. And you are in the unique category of of not even being a band. You are an individual that you know. Do you consider yourself a hired gun? Are you in that category? Um. Yeah. Uh, uh, honestly, yeah. You know, sometimes. Is that, are you are you comfortable with that term? Or is that? I am. I am because. Um, I just see a lot of because I play with so many different people, so many bands. I see patterns in behavior of certain musicians, and sometimes I feel that people that 
people that really are hired guns, they don't want to admit it. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's like... It's like a dirty word. Yeah, it, yeah, it's it's a dirty word. But at, at the same time, it's like, fuck, I have to play... I, I, I get to play all kinds of different music. You know, like right now I'm here in Los Angeles playing Morbid Angel. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm rehearsing the most extreme music ever written. But, you know, maybe a year ago I was playing Miami with the singer for Pretty Boy Floyd, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or, it, or uh, it all started really doing work with pop bands in Brazil. You know okay, what so I mean? let's, let's go, before we talk about what you're doing right, right now, yeah. I, I have no idea about how you actually got to America mm -hmm. from Brazil. When did, when did you, so you were working with, I don't, so you were working with pop bands in Brazil. No, no, yeah. I, uh, in Brazil what happened, um, Brazil is a very metal country. You know yeah. what I mean? We we gave Sepultura to the world. Oh, that and, was you? And, like you personally did that? Thank you. <laughs> well, that's why I said we, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and a funny thing about Sepultura is I only learned to appreciate their music after I was in America. Yeah. But, that, you know, that's a different story. But, you know, we, we gave we gave Sepultura to the world and, you know, Crisium and Angra. And there's the three bands that people will ever hear from Brazil. We have so many great musicians, so many, so much talent there. Um, but there's this kind of block in the audiences down in Brazil that if your band is from Brazil, nobody gives a fuck. Yeah. And it's really hard to explain to someone that's not from Brazil. I think a know? lot of places are like that, though. Like, I remember coming up in New Jersey and in a way, like our goal to get big or our our methodology was mm -hmm. to actually trick people into thinking we weren't a local band. <laughs> That's kind of Be what it is, yeah. Because people, when they think you're local, they're just like, oh, they're just some some people yeah. around here. And there's, you know, I've heard that about Sweden. Like, I remember when we toured with Op Opeth, they were like, ah, no one cares about yeah. us. No one cares about us in, in Gothenburg. Uh, in our hometown, they're like it's like we're we're much more popular everywhere else. Well, so. the, uh, it's funny that you said uh, methodology or whatever because that's kind of what I felt in Brazil when I left Brazil. I kind of made a point to like never say I was Brazilian. You yeah. know, when I got to the states and I realized that that's kind of cool. Of course, it's like, cool. Yeah, yeah, but I, uh, as a Brazilian, you don't see it that way. You know what I mean? I had to kind of Americanize my mind to understand. Oh, okay, I get, I get why it's kind of. Cool so when now. did you get here? Yeah. Okay. So that that's a funny story, dude. And I'm glad I'm, you know, because you have a lot of listeners, and I always thought that my story is too crazy for people not to know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, no. See, uh, uh, what I'm gonna tell you is 100% serious. Because of what I was telling you in Brazil, I always knew that I had to somehow leave. You know leave Brazil and do something outside. Um, but this is early, the early 2000s, even though there's the internet, it, communication is not the same way as it is now, you know, where you text your buddy in Russia. It wasn't quite like that yet. But MySpace existed. And, and oh yeah, and to the, the pop band subject, uh, towards the end of my attempts of being a musician in Brazil, I got in contact with this pop band. They, they had a number one hit, you know, and they, they had, they were blowing up and they had just, you know, had man problems with their manager. They were like a boy band, kind of like happened to NSYNC here in, in the States. And I started writing some music with those guys and it was the first time I did something that was outside of metal. And I was like, oh, this kind of works, you know, because if the album does well, I'm a genius because I wrote it. <laughs> if the album doesn't do well, well, it wasn't my music. I'm not in the band. Who gives can't, a fuck? Can't lose. It, it, okay. Well, that, that was my first attempt. But then I really, really wanted to come to the States. Okay. So in 2005, I was on MySpace and I found power. Another thing. I'm a, like, my background is power metal, which in America, nobody's into. You that's, know, not, like, that's not really true, but... Well, I mean, it, I'm, it's... Yo, I'm from New Jersey. You know who's from New Jersey? Symphony X. You can kiss my ass. That's true. Symphony... Fuck yeah, man. I just toured with Russ and... Actually, and, 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 and Sabotage is from New Jersey, Sabotage too. Sabotage is from Florida. They're from Florida? Yeah. Why do I think they're from New Jersey? They're not. I just made that up. But, they but I'm the, glad... Doc lying on the podcast. Well, yeah. you know... Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing I grew up on, you know... Uh, uh, Symphony X, uh, fucking Stradivarius, Old Halloween. You know, I was never too much in the heavy stuff uh, until recently, you know. So 
I was like, okay, I should move to the States and I should, I should find, a, find a power metal man in the States. How the fuck am I going to do that? I found one on MySpace and they had two news. One of them was Celador signs to Metal Blade Records. And then right below, Celador is looking for a lead guitarist. I'm like, that's it. That's my ticket to America. I got to hit up this band. I love that opportunism. So, so I wrote them an email. And I didn't say I was from Brazil either. You know, I'm like, I, I, you know, you can't hear the accent. So I just wrote them an email. Hey, you know, I want to try out for you guys, blah, blah, blah. At that point, I hadn't even heard their music. I didn't care. What do you mean? You know? Oh, you hadn't even heard their music? Yeah, I didn't care. I just wanted to be in a band. And they said they were power metal. Their list of influences had like Halloween, Stradivarius. It was all, I knew it was my cup of tea. I'm like, whatever they throw at me, I'm going to do well, whatever. So I get a response. And the guy's like, you know, we have a guitarist. And I respond. I'm like, unless you have Steve Vai in your band, I'm a better choice. Give me a, give me a chance. <laughs> you know? Confident. You are, you are very confident in yourself. So the guy's like, all right, well, then learn these four songs, you know? I'm like, okay. So then I went and listened to the song. I spent that night working, you know, like it was Iron Maiden. Like it was the biggest gig because I wanted to move to America. Sent the guys a demo back. Nah, no mention of the label at this point, just saying I like the band. The guy's like, okay, wow. Uh, you want to come jam with us? I was like, yeah, I thought so. Okay. So you sent them like a video? No, just an uh, MP3 of me playing on top of their demo thing. Okay. You know? Um, so I made up some story. I can't remember exactly what I said, but uh, somehow I told them I lived in Florida. And that was bullshit. You know, I just didn't want to say to a brand new band with 20-year-old kids that, hey, I'm going to move from Brazil to be in your band in Nebraska. Oh, yeah, I didn't mention that. They're in Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska. Well, sure enough, man, we, you know, we set things up. I told them I was from Florida, and I was like, you know what? I'm coming. I'll, I'll come for an audition. Um, I'll get a hotel. Don't worry about me, you know. But I made sure they didn't have to worry about anything. You know, mm -hmm. I did the audition. I got the gig. They were on Metal Blade. So, you know, right away, we're off to the studio. Actually, the first festival I ever played you guys were on. We played the New England uh, Metal Festival. What, what year was that? 2000? 2005, probably. 2005? Yeah, I remember we played, and then I went to the main stage, and you guys were on. Oh, I, who are we out? I'm trying to remember. That who was we the on. first time I ever saw God Forbid. Yeah. Or heard we, of you were guys. Were we okay? <laughs> yeah. I, oh, here, here. <laughs> just so you remember, you guys pulled Howard was on, on the side stage or whatever, and you pulled him, him on stage, did some backing vocals. This was my first festival in America. You know, and he was with this band with 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 Salvador. But you know, Brian Slago really liked us. It was really like one of his baby bands. He wanted to make us happen. We were a bunch of stupid kids. That's the truth. You know, we we just. So how did you? How could you afford? Like, here's what I don't know. A, how could you even afford to like get to America, buy hotels? Mm -hmm. How did you li like? How did you even survive when you when you got here? And mm -hmm. then how did you figure out the like the the visas and all that stuff? Okay. So one of the things that the label was supposed to help me with was the visa, you know. Oh, how, um, did, the, how did the band take it when you finally told them you were from Brazil? Oh, man, they freaked out. <laughs> in fact, to this day, to this day, I think that the, the main guy in the band is still like, oh, is the government watching me or something? Because I remember I explained to him, I'm like, dude, it's a, it's a, it's basically, a, a, you got to tell the government that there's nobody better than me to do this job in America and then you need to that's all you because have to do because they don't want to take jobs from Americans exactly I'm like that's all you have to do and well I, but at the end of the day it didn't work you know the visa didn't work because the requirements for the visa included you know uh, magazines and, and shit like that that I had done before and I wasn't nobody in Brazil so well, you know? couldn't you just say you're going to America for vacation and then just stay I wouldn't do that yeah because I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely you, you would get in trouble <laughs> Well, yeah, but uh, plus, plus, I mean, that's not, you know, that's not how you do things, man. You know, that's, that's, I know way too many, way too many foreigners that live here illegally or overstay their visa. Um, I didn't work. I didn't record. I didn't really practice with the band or anything. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, if I told the government, hey, I'm just coming here for, for, for tourism. And then I went and played shows and shit. That's a crime. You know, so I didn't, I didn't want to do anything like that. But 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 I was allowed a certain period here, and within that period, I ended up getting married. And you know, but 
And how could I afford? Well, my, my parents had money. You know, my yeah. parents my parents always helped me out. They were very supportive from the beginning. They didn't want me to come here for nothing. Like they didn't. And uh, you know, did you train uh, like classically in Brazil? Yes, yes. I went to I went to to university for composition and conducting. So, uh, but I did. Uh, I dropped out before. It was a six year course. I did the first three years. But I heard you you trained with Kiko, right? That was my first guitar teacher. That's that so was... he he. You were lucky enough to like where he lived near you. He didn't. He didn't live near me, but even at that age, he was already a well-known guitarist uh, dude, in Brazil. That, that dude is yeah. a freak of nature. You see, and and, and that's the thing uh, that I'm really happy. You know how I said at the beginning, I'm like, I know power metal is not real popular in America. That style of guitar playing that Kiko has, like, for to a lot of people I know, that's new. But that's what I grew up on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I just like, I just noticed when I saw him with Megadeth. It just seemed like I like it. He was the first Megadeth guitar player I saw where it just seemed like it was easy. Mm -hmm. Like he was just, yeah, I'm just, he's, he was smiling and just like it was no sweat. All that I will say, the, I will say this on record. I don't care who's listening. Uh, other than Friedman, that is the best guitar player to ever be in Megadeth. You know, Kiko, in my opinion, that's the best. And, and th I'll, I'll go beyond. I, I know there's a Rust in Peace lineup, but. Well, that's with Friedman, though. Exactly. Other than that, this is the best lineup they ever had, you know, right now. Would you to say me, with, with Dirk or with... with Dirk and Kiko? Oh, okay. Like to me, that's the best Megadeth can possibly ever sound. Well, those are know? some serious, serious uh, players. I, I do. I, I got to get do. Dirk on here and talk about some stuff. It, it's, it's true, man. I mean, I mean, he's the man for the job. You know, like he, Dirk is the man for the job and Kiko is the best lead guitar player in the world. You know, he's in that genre. I'm, you know, I'm not saying he's better than Alan Holdsworth, but I'm saying he, in the style that we play, I don't think anybody in the world today does that better. You know? Yeah, he's incredible. And, and that's, uh, that wasn't always the case. I wasn't, I mean, I grew up on, that, on his play and I was a really big fan of his band Angra um, when I grew up. Um, but then after a while, they lost me. You know, like, like, but then I saw him in Megadeth. I'm like, holy fuck, that's, that's it. You know, that's right. what he should be doing. So what, so, so, all right. So you're in America. Yeah. You, okay. you, you kind of figure out your, your visa situation eventually. Yeah. I kind of figure out my By visa. getting married. Is that what actually fixed it? That is what fixed it. Yes. Um, so what was, I, what was, so, I, so pretty much I remember Celador came on my radar yeah. when I think God forbid was looking for support for one of our tours. And I've just been seeing the name around. I think yeah. I saw you guys were opening for All That Remains. I saw you guys were opening for Trivium. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is... And that was right around the time that Dragon Force mm -hmm. was getting really big. So it's to me, it seemed like that genre was on the come up. And and I, and God forbid, we were in that phrase, phrase, in that phase where we were really trying to distance ourselves from the metalcore thing. And we wanted to tour with more like real metal bands. Um, it, as far as when we were headlining, so that's when you guys kind of came on my radar. So what was that like when you know you? It's like you're pretty much brand new in America, and you're in a band that's actually doing things. It, like, did you feel like that band was gonna make it, or did you, or you, it was just you just didn't know anything? You were just kind of going for it. Well, I mean, th there's a whole different podcast I can do about this, but I see things in my life, and the older I get, the more I see that it, it is how it works in steps. You know what I mean? You can never achieve too much too fast. I mean, sometimes you can, yeah, but it's luck. So I always thought in steps. At that point, all I cared about was the next step, which was getting to America and getting settled here, you know, because of the visa issues. And quite honestly, I hated being in Brazil. I love touring Brazil. I love playing shows there as an American artist. But fuck living there, you know. Why? Why? What? What, what don't you like about Brazil? Uh, may, mainly what I said at the beginning, you know, the the lack of support for the local musician. Um, but I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot worse than it is here when people talk about their local scene. I mean, in Brazil, it's there's a. It's very hard to explain to someone that's not that hasn't lived there for a long time. But there's a culture in Brazil that I'm better than you. So why would I? Why should I listen to you? Yeah. At, Everything. Almost like a Hollywood 
thing like it's a lot like it it's a lot like hollywood where everyone's a musician so yeah. why support musicians it's kind of. a it's a lot like hollywood in fact that's what bothered me about living here you know yeah. i was like oh it's like it, it's the same thing it's like but how are you gonna serve someone something that they don't want to consume because yeah. they think they can do better yeah. you know yeah. so everybody in brazil is like that and plus corruption poverty and, and all yeah. that I, I don't i don't get political but um but America, you felt, was a better situation. I did. I did. I wanted to either come here or go to Europe, you know. And, and, but I always felt that America was more a closer, the, the culture is closer. You know mm. what I mean? If I went to Germany, I would freak out, you know. So, um, Bringen Sie Deutsch? Yeah, a, a little bit. Well, that's all I, I know. I'm so. a kind of bit. I'm a kind of bit. Is it bit? I don't fucking know. Um, Bitter? That's please? Right? <laughs> I don't know. But, but then, uh, and then I saw, it, I saw the band started getting big, and that kind of fucked with my head. Honestly, man, and I say that now, because... What do you mean, fuck? Like, you went to your head? Like, you started getting arrogant? Dude, very much so. I think about it today, and I think about how ridiculous some of the things I, I used to say. Well, just to give you an idea, I used to introduce me, myself around town as Bill Hudson from Salador. That's hey, I'm Bill Hudson from Salador. Well, if yeah. you didn't know who Salador was, you're a dick. You well, know, like well, that I, kind of. Well, I, I I would also say that for young people, if you're in your early 20s and you start to have success with a band, and music was all that you thought about for the years leading up to that, that really in a lot of ways describes your identity. Yeah. You know, so that's that is who you are. You were Bill from Salador. Because yeah. guess what? Without without that. Who else were you? Yeah, that's true. At, that's at true. the time, and, yeah, then, yeah. and then we then we grow up, we develop, we become fully formed human beings. No, but, but I mean, I was, it, I'm sure I was the same way. It got ridiculous to the point that one time I was talking to someone at NAM, and this person said that they met Eddie Van Halen, and I was like, "So what? You met me." You know, it got that retarded. I never said that. I know. <laughs> I know. I was 22 years old. You know what I mean? But, but um, I mean, truth be told, you know, uh, I got here and then right uh, the first tour we did was Bullet for My Valentine. That's the first time I ever toured in my so life. So your first tour, yeah. you're playing like a sold out like theaters. Yeah, it was it wasn't quite as big as it is now, but it's like 1,500, 2,000 people. I remember when they yeah. first started, like they pretty much came out the gate and they were and crushing it. Yeah, and it was all sold out and we did. Young kids, girls. Yeah, we did that tour and then, and, and obviously I was thinking those people were there to see us. Of course, <laughs> that's how I always felt. And then after that, we did like a, a head line run and you you know we played for like seven people in portland 12 people in like new hampshire or something yeah that's that's what that's when re the reality set, yeah. sets in that's when i was like okay maybe we're not that big yet but then we went out with trivium and 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 that was pretty big again i was like okay so are we you know but uh, uh, you were still as, learning you were learning uh, what, what the business uh, was and at the same time i was i personally but the entire band but me personally i was developing a serious alcohol problem and i was getting into the habit of getting drunk and telling people to fuck off like this is serious we were on tour like with, people you're on tour with yeah we were okay we were opening for for vital remains first day on the tour the bass player at the time the girl uh genie she Oh, from, from all their means. Yeah, at the time, she's like, oh, come out the bus, you know, come hang out a little bit. I started drinking their vodka. And I don't really remember the rest, but I got scolded and everybody was mad at me. Well, uh, Jeremy Safer was yeah. there with the camera. And he got me telling the tour manager, the tour manager's like, hey, can you slow down a little bit? But fuck you, shut up. Like he got so that you were camera. just you were like an asshole. I was a total asshole, man. <laughs> you were that and, guy. So this is a, a situation where you had a band. Because did you? All right. So when Dragon Force started blowing up, did you guys get like super jealous? Because you were like, that should be well, us. No, because Metal. We were kind of the American answer to that. Metal Blade was trying to get us on the road with them. Yeah. And at the same time, I personally, way before Salador, I knew Herman from Dragon Force from their demo days, you know, like Cuz you're like so, you're like the power metal Eddie yeah. Trunk. You're you know yeah. all that shit. Yeah, <laughs> and I was an annoying kid since I was young, you know, and and I talked to him back then, back before they were signed or anything. Um as they said as they started getting bigger, what did annoy me back then was the comparisons because even though both men were fast and melodic, 
we didn't sound anything alike. Well, I was, yeah, but you have to understand that if you're not a big power metal fan, it's like if someone has never heard death metal and then you play them Morbid Angel and then play them Cannibal Corpse, to them it sounds the same. To them it just sounds the same, yeah. So so I was just, it's so in preparation for this, I was like, oh, let me go back and listen to some Celador. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's in that realm. Like there's, there's definitely, uh, I could see how people could make the comparisons, especially because you you were contemporaries, like you, you were of, true. of the same era. And it's and, true. But um, no, but so all right. So how did you end up leaving that band? Um, okay, so this is two thousand. Uh, okay, we did, dude. I mean, we were doing. They sent us to Japan. Okay, uh, me me and the main songwriter guitarist uh, another thing i learned over the years not to do anymore by the way if you're listening to this and you're a musician for hire or you want to be a musician for hire you want to hear this story and never do this <laughs> me me and the main songwriter the guy who got the band signed the guy who did everything we kept butting hats because we did, he was a guitarist we were competitive and i mean uh, i just I wanted to steal the band from the guy, you know, I wanted things to go my way and he wanted things to go his way, but it was his band, you know, I shouldn't be. You were trying to steal a dude's band. Basically, yeah. I mean, I know I say this now, but basically (laughs) what it is, is like, okay, this guy wrote the, the first album, the whole first album, every single song on it. Then here I am trying to write the next album. You know what I mean? You weren't trying to be fair and balance it. Yeah, well, it was his band. You know, I should have, from the beginning, known my place. And I'm the lead guitarist. It's your band, whatever. That's what I do now. You yeah. Know? I play yeah, what the, you tell me. But the thing is, but if <laughs> the way I look at it, like when, God forbid, brought in Matt Wickland in, in our band, you know, we pretty much did 50 50. Um, because me, I, at the end of the day, I just want good ideas. You know, well, I don't care. I don't care where. Yeah, this from. guy wasn't like that, <laughs> and he still isn't. I mean, right now he's he, they're putting out a new album, and he's the singer too now. But you know, back to what I was saying, we were, we were me and this guy kept butting heads, and him and the singer also didn't like each other. Oh, and 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 the singer just stopped caring. I mean, dude, we had this the year after I told you that I saw you guys at a New England Metal Fest. We were playing it again. But we were like three to headliner or whatever. It so was, the band was moving up. Yeah, yeah. It was, I don't know. It was us as a lay dying cannibal corpse, like the top bill. And it was Metal Blade's 25th anniversary, right? Um, we were going to be on the DVD. We were going to be high on the bill. Everybody was going to know who Salader was. We, we were taking a bus from the, for the first time. We parked the bus in front of this guy's house. He's nowhere to be found. The singer. Everybody's calling him, what the fuck is this guy? He doesn't answer. I'm like, dude. He shows up three hours later. We're still waiting at his house. We're in Nebraska. The show is in Boston. So we have to be there, you know. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to go because I can't get along with Chris, the guitarist. I'm like, really? Do you see the fucking buzz outside of your house? Dude, we got Brian Slago on the phone. Slago couldn't, conv- couldn't talk this guy into going. So that's when I kind of had it. I'm like, yeah, it's the Metal Blade 25th anniversary. Your band is high up the bill. Don't fucking do that. That's why I don't still don't talk to this guy because of that. You know? Yeah, it's it's hard to to reconcile something like that because it it's that even if like let's say like my whole thing with you know leaving a band is understand that what your decisions affect other people and. Even if he didn't get along, at least help these people out, these people you spent all this time with, yeah. and just do this one show. Was it part of a tour or was it a one-off? No, it, it was a one-off. But That's what I'm saying. Do this one show. Or like, I love the situation that happened in Arch Enemy, where the pr- current singer helped find, or the, or the previous singer helped yeah. find the current singer. And just because you no longer want to work with the band professionally doesn't mean you have to screw them over. You yeah. know, you can you can not want to be in a band and still be cool with everybody. You know what I mean? I, even if you don't get along with someone, yeah. you know, it doesn't have to be so crazy. You well, know, at least as far as I'm concerned. You well, know? I mean, in our case, though, this guy was, like, taking it too far. It's, it, like, we went to Japan. We played this giant festival, Loud Park. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, the headliner that night was having a hell of a deal. Hey, you man. Know? I got to play with him. And then, and then... Slago is like, you guys are going back home to finish the demos. We had like 20 songs between me and the other guitarist, and the singer wouldn't sing over them. 
he just wouldn't take our calls and you wouldn't, wouldn't you didn't, so even after he didn't do that show we you didn't kick him out going, oh, well, the label liked him you know that's crazy now that's and, that you can't do that because then that's someone literally holding the band yeah, hostage well, th that's why I, that's why i quit that's when you know we came back from japan oh yeah and we had an offer to do a big tour it was gonna be like our channel shadows fall in us in japan and that fell through because we weren't done with the album you know we were going out with king diamond and creator that year oh no but king diamond canceled that that wasn't our fault all I know is like this guy is doing all these things that I just couldn't handle, man. And that honestly, that's when I got disenchanted with the whole band thing. Yeah. You know, that's when I was like, you know what? Uh, I don't want to deal with this. Uh, every band has it. So you guys deal with this. You give me my money. I'll play guitar and I shot my. Well, I think I think know. the, you know, my, after I left, God forbid, and I moved to L.A. I was kind of like, all right. And then actually, what what inspired me to say, oh, maybe I should do more hired gun type stuff was when I played with Lamb of God and I was like oh well if this is one of the greatest metal bands in the world maybe yeah. I am good enough to do fill in spots or do you know do, 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 do stuff like that so I think what you're saying is something I can relate to is that being in a, a real band when you're in the band it's like being in a relationship it's mm -hmm. a commitment and the hardest thing about it for me and probably for someone like you is everyone else's actions affect you like oh, you you're you have so little control mm -hmm. over what happens because you can do the right thing even though clearly you made some you fucked up a lot <laughs> oh, i fucked up a lot <laughs> but all right but even in, in spite of that um you can do everything right but if one person in the band does something stupid or one like one person can derail a career mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you don't Especially in a band at that at the level you're at, you don't get a lot of second and third chances. Yep. And it's one thing, if, like I said, if you're Vince Neil back in 1982, guess what? You get 100 chances because your exactly. band is selling out arenas and you're selling millions of records. And you can show up to the show drunk, high on heroin, and they will cart you out there and yeah. they will take care of everything. But when you're on an underground level, you only get that usually that one or two shots at the most – at making it and getting getting because you guys you're doing huge tours mm -hmm. you were b building and building and growing and growing and i've noticed the bands that seem to do the best are the ones that are able to keep everything keep a good equilibrium mm -hmm. and they're they, they're the ones with the least amount of drama yeah and if they do have drama you don't hear about it mm -hmm. it's it, behind closed doors and they take care of their business yeah you know, for the most part, of course, there are situations <laughs> that are yeah. a little more, mm -hmm. uh, you know, off the chain. But uh, yeah. And then, you know, after that came the next part of my career, which I mean, hired every, gun period. Yeah. It, not well, it didn't start like that either. I grew up, I grew up uh, loving a band called Sabotage, you know, um, from those, New Jersey. They're not. They're from Florida. New Jersey. <laughs> they're from Florida. I saw them in New Jersey. I believe you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> they're from Florida. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but you know, I, dude, I, 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 I always loved that band. And when I was 17, um, they, they, uh, Al Petrelli, a guitarist, left actually to join Megadeth. Yep. And uh, and me on my 16 year old mind in Brazil, I told my girlfriend who spoke English at the time, "Hey, you should write Sabotage. Maybe I can join the band." You know, that's the first time I actually tried something like that. And she, I mean, we never got a response or whatever at that time. But it it never stopped crossing my mind. I'm like, you know, the Sabotage thing became the Trans Siberian Orchestra, and that's a pretty big thing, you know. If I, I can play that music really well, maybe one day I can get hooked up with that. That's when one day I was playing the Prague Power Festival in Atlanta with Salador, and I saw Zach Stevens, who was the singer for Sabotage, one of my favorite singers, you know. And I went and took a picture with him as a fan, and we got drunk. See, man, everything at the time revolved around alcohol. That's why I haven't touched that thing in so long. But we got drunk, and I'm like, hey, if you ever need a guitarist, you know, give me a call. And he did, like, maybe a week later, you know. After, and then I joined the band, and, and I started, like, at the same time I was playing with this band in the UK. So I started feeling what it was like to tour with a band and come off this and tour with this band. At this time, I wasn't making any real money, but I wasn't losing it, you know, because the main thing about being a hired gun is that you, you, 
you can you can make certain demands and then if they don't offer you that then you don't go you know yeah. so one thing especially at the beginning when i was starting 24 25 years old was like okay even if i'm not going to bring any money home i won't spend any you know yeah so uh, there was this band power quest from the uk uh since you talked about dragon force it's one of the members in dragon force that was my first time outside of the u.s by know? the way one of the all-time great band names, Power Qu- Quest. Power Quest. I yeah. mean, that's just that yeah. is some triumphant yeah. shit. The band sounds exactly like the name suggests. I know. I you went. Know? I went and listened to it, <laughs> and I was like, "This is some triumphant, yeah. you know, going, you know, going through the forest <laughs> to rescue the princess, yes. with a bow and arrow." Very much. <laughs> so, Very did you much. actually move to the UK? No, I just did this one tour with them. But, you know, it was, that's what I mean. That's when I started feeling this whole uh, hired gun thing. But did you, all right, so when you're done with Celador, yeah. now is your, do you have a plan? No. So you're just kind of just playing it by ear, but you know you want to keep rocking. Well, I started a band, I tried to start another band. I don't even talk about that. But I tried to start another band, actually with the bass player for Dragon Force at the time, Adrian. And a drummer that just passed away, one of my best friends, Adam Sagan, and... I had problems with the singer again in that band. I couldn't get the singer to record, you know, demos. Singers, man. Yeah. <laughs> fuck <laughs> singers. Tommy, I love you, dude, but fuck <laughs> singers, man. Listen. Tommy's we- the only one, the only singer, dude, that I ever worked with that, that like, shows up and does and does his thing. You know well, what I mean? Is, you like, know, I, so I'm thinking of changing the name of the po- this podcast from the yeah. X-Man to six degrees of Tommy Vex because every like almost every person on here has worked with Tommy in some yeah. in some some fashion. I, he so delivers need, it, you know, unlike other singers. Listen, know? he's you know hardest working man in metal. Fuck yeah, it is, man. Well, well, besides Bill Hudson, of course. <laughs> oh, besides Bill Hudson, yeah. It's just, well, mine doesn't depend on my voice, so I can keep going, you know. That's true. And uh, well, yeah. So I, I I started doing a lot of things at the same time. I went and did this Power Quest tour. This was like two thousand eight. At the same time, I started working with the Sabotage singer here with his band Circle to Circle, which we do we do great in Europe, but we tried to do a U.S. tour and we got seventy people a night. Was yeah, funny. I was so I was actually so I was, I was listening to some Circle to Circle and it's yeah. it's so it's funny. I saw uh, John Oliva's Pain on an off date in two thousand nine at this weird festival in Spain, and I watched I watched them and. And I'd seen Sabotage before. And then I see... So it's just this thing where he's has all these different projects yeah. that just... And he can obviously, I guess, make a... You know, they go overseas and do well. Yeah. For, and so they pretty much live in Europe and... I, do they go to South America and stuff well, like that? Well, Circle to Circle is a, is a, is a different uh, singer from Sabotage. Okay. But John Oliva Spain is the same case. He's another sabotage. I play for both. But John Oliva's know? in Circle to Circle as well? No. Oh, he's not. I'm sorry. No. See, I'm, John, see, I'm... O- John Oliva is the guy that writes all the Trans Siberian Orchestra music. Yeah. All the, even though he doesn't travel. You yeah. Know? But he, he he's just he's the he's the mastermind behind this whole thing. You yeah. Know? But he has his band John Oliva Spain, but he doesn't really like to play. He he, he you know he he's fine doing the Trans Siberian Orchestra. You know he. He doesn't. Need... I heard they're doing pretty well. Yeah, so <laughs> he doesn't. Uh, you know, it's it, it's hard to like be a good enough situation for him to do to want to do anything. You know. So so who offered you the circle to circle gig? The singer f- for Sabotage, the other singer. Okay. Who is al- who is also the founding member of Circle to Circle? It's way too many names. There's a lot of. I'm saying there's a yeah. lot of cross section. It's yeah. like a little family. Is it this whole Sabotage family thing? I've played with all of them. With John Oliva Spain, with Circle to Circle, and now he's a trans. Have Marcus you played with Sabotage ever? At Vakin last year on the headlining set, yeah, that was the craziest day of my life, <laughs> and 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 no, and because you know what I was telling you back then about being a kid and wanting to play in Sabotage, I also wanted to headline Vakin. I also, it's like all of this happened at the same time. You know, we were the main band of Vakin, and I was playing Sabotage for the first time because Sabotage stopped in two thousand two. That's my camera, my GoPro. Is it? Is it? gonna What's blow it? up is it done that means the battery's done yeah oh so it filmed both oh yeah because i've been filming this yeah so um, that, if you heard so, that beeping that was there so sabotage the they stopped in 2002 
and they did this Vakken show last year, which was a reunion show. And and I'm the only guy that wasn't there that played, you know. So it's it, it was you were like the nuts. only non original member. Yeah. Or, I'm like this is fucking crazy, you know. Well, so actually, so that's something that's kind of fascinating about you to me is that you're the type of person that puts an intention mm-hmm. out into the universe. I guess yeah. for for a yeah. la- lack of a better way to I'm put it, you. so. In that you have your you have very big ambitions, mm-hmm. and then you also have the confidence that says, "Hey, I am, I have the ability to to do these things, and somehow put yourself in a position to accomplish them." Is like is that something you focus on? Just the positive thinking and like having these these big goals? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Because um, I've had. I've had situations in my life, this one being one of them, the whole sabotage thing, you know, like situations in my life show, show me that no matter what, you can make whatever you want happen. Even if you, you know, if you, it, it doesn't matter. I can think of a situation where you can't, you know, like I, like I said at the beginning, though, I, I, I was lucky enough that my parents were supportive forever, you know, like uh, from, from the very beginning. They let me go to music school. They, 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 you know, they made sure I had all the training. They helped me come to the States. But ultimately, you know, it's like, okay. Ultimately, you have to, to get somewhere, you have to know where you're going. You know what I mean? I see, I see a lot of musicians and, and, and bands that like, they start the band. They know everything they want to do around LA. They even got the look down before they get the music down. Oh, I say, I say <laughs> motherfuckers out here be spending more time at the, uh, in front of the mirror than they do practice. It's like, well, does it even matter to you what music you play? You know, but, but what I mean is that people create these products of these bands or whatever, but then they don't know what the fuck to do with it. You know, it's like, oh, we're going to play shows. Okay. Well, then what? You know, you yeah. got to have, you, you got to have a plan. I knew, I knew certain things. I wanted to be a guitar player. I wanted to live in the US. I wanted to play with the Trans Siberian Orchestra. And I wanted to make a, live, a living playing guitar. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't want my parents paying my bills when I'm 30. When did you come you to know? LA? I came to LA in 2008. Um, oh, so it, pretty much right after you left Salador. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I stayed in Nebraska basically because of Salador. You know, yeah. uh, even though my wife is from there, I got married there, and my whole family is there. My wife also wanted to get out. You know, so I, I, with Salador working, uh, I was there, and then the second it didn't work out. At the same time, my wife got accepted at U, uh, USC. Mm-hmm. For 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 film, and I'm like, you know what? Let's just move to LA. So, did you, you feel know? like LA was a place you could network better and find more opportunities? Like, did you feel like you got out of this town what you what you thought you could? Mm, no, not really. To be very honest, I I to be very honest, from the beginning, I wanted to go to Florida because I know how much metal there is there. You know, there's yeah. all the death metal bands. There's, uh, there's Sabotage. There's Camelot. All these bands are in Florida. So I wanted to be there first. But then my wife got accepted into college here, and I came here. What but... about New Jersey? That's where Sabotage is from. <laughs> <laughs> Symphony X is from there. I play with Russ, man. He's awesome. Dude. You know Russ? Hell yeah, I know Russ. That's my man. We used to have the same manager as as Symphony X. But, oh, no but actually, but I knew... I knew the Symphony X guys before that because uh, Michael R- Romeo had helped uh, God Forbid out with some. Oh, he did the orchestration. Yeah, he right? did orchestration. He um, he helped us out. Oh, and then the other Mike, the um, Le Pon. Yeah, no, no, the Mike Pinella, the oh. keyboard player, played keyboards on two or three of our records, and we met them through our producer Eric Rachel, who produced the first like four or five Symphony X records. So that was that's like the New Jersey metal metal band connection you know See, that's why i respect god forbid different than the other bands at the time because you guys are real metal man no, i we, know you talked about this before i am one of those guys from your well, from we, your article we were always <laughs> uh we were this band that we got involved in the metal in the hardcore scene but as metalheads. you yeah. know our our favorite bands at that time were pantera and machine head and Megadeth and Metal that, that was our entry point and then we kind of got this huge 
hardcore slash metalcore influence. But for us, we were always metalheads who happened to be, to be in, in the hardcore. hardcore scene. So that stuff, you know, we were very, in a way, judgmental of a lot of the metalcore bands who were trying to do metal. Because yeah. we're like, we're, we know the real shit. Yeah. So we see people who were, you know, some people call it like fake metal. Yeah. You know, like, like, like almost like the, the, uh, Idiot's Guide to, to, to Metal. Like, you can tell people who, who knew it, but they just kind of knew the basics. So, so we were kind of, or at least myself, I'd say, I was very very much a purist, in a sense, mm-hmm. for a while. And, yeah, I liked the real <laughs> stuff, you know, Arch Enemy and Soil Work yeah. and, you know, Symphony X, bands, bands like that who really... And so, I don't know, I feel like maybe as from a technical standpoint, we were maybe like maybe an inch of a notch down from some of those bands. Uh, but we were always trying to be on that level. It was like, these bands are at the super top level in terms of proficiency yeah. and technicality. And and that's what we were always trying to get to. And that was, you know, there was something that's, important to that. That's cool. See, man, like as a, it's interesting you say that because as a Brazilian too, um, like I said, I grew up with power metal and all that. And I didn't, when I moved to the States, man, I remember being in Nebraska and meeting this kid that was a metal kid. He had, he, 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 like, he had his guitar he had on the strap, like, uh, new metal is dead and I killed it. And then, <laughs> and then he played me a song. I'm not going to say what band it is, but it's one of the big metalcore bands. And I my first thought is like, this sounds just like Korn. <laughs> he got so mad. What are you talking about? This is man. I'm like, I'm sorry. That's corn. That's that's to me. That's for me. I've never had a problem with new metal. I actually liked. I actually liked new metal. No, I I did too. But this guy was saying he was a metal head, and he was, you know, and like saying it was a different thing. You know, I I never got into that whole like genre bashing. Yeah, thing, I, you know. I, I I never understood that it was, but to me at like the heavy time, music is heavy music. Exactly, exactly. You know, to me at the time, in America, you guys were just listening to bow bow bow. Well, I guess that's what you listen. Da-dum, to. Da-dum, da-dum, yeah, da-dum. yeah. But you know, I, I I remember like seeing this band solo. I think Trivium was the first one. I was like, wow, these guys know that their guitar has six strings. Well, that was also, but Trivium, for example, had the benefit of coming on the heels of bands like us and Killswitch and Shadows Fall. They, in a sense, they got to... Shadows Fall is another one. I was like, oh, these guys solo. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, but that, but I remember when we were doing that in Shadows Fall, that people were like, whoa, bands are playing solos again, even though we were following In Flames and we were following... Yeah, you weren't trying to follow them. You're trying to follow the European Yeah, we were, we were influenced, or for us... We, our influences were were the American thrash metal bands, so that was what you're supposed to do. It's yeah. like Testament, Anthrax. You do the solo after this, after the second chorus. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's just yeah. you know part you know what what you were expected to do. And even though when we when we were super young, like we weren't very good at soloing, we just did it anyway. <laughs> we're like, oh, you're supposed <laughs> well, to. Have that's a how you started, you know. <laughs> you know, and then you just kind of get better and better. You work work on it, but um, yeah, man. But yeah, so by the time Trivium came along, they we that whole scene kind of existed, and they were able to just be a metal band. They didn't. Whereas we came up out of the hardcore scene, and in a way, we almost had to have a foot in that world sonically. Yeah, they could just be a straight ahead metal band, and there was. A, a scene had kind of revived and they could play off of that. And, you know, and to their credit, you know, that, you know, that out, you know, ascendancy blew the doors yeah. off everything. That's the first album I heard. And I still think it's the best. It's, you know? it's, it's definitely, there's something about, you know, some records are just special, yeah. you know, and you just can't, there's, you know, it's, and we all hope we can have that one record, you know, that just, you just nailed it, you know, and, yeah. and it's it's a it's a snapshot in time. We got to tour with them in the UK at the tail end of that record cycle, and it's the only tour I've ever done where every single show was sold out before the tour started. That's killer. And and it was and the smallest venue was like fourteen hundred capacity. It was not. It was, it's probably actually the best tour Goth Grid ever ever did because we were also at the peak of our popularity and we did really well in the UK and it was uh, stylistically, it was perfect. So we was, uh, it was nuts, you That's know, cool, man. and props. Was, we took Trivium on their first tour and like a lot of bands who don't return the favor, 
Mm-hmm. Trivium returned the favor. And oh, that's, awesome. you know, I'm still good friends with those guys, and I always appreciate that. Yeah, those that. guys are awesome, man. I love everything about them. It's great. You know, Matt's so, dad sold me my house, man. I what's, love those oh, guys. really? Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, those guys are cool. Also, from, from New Jersey. I mean, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Trivium. Anyway, yeah. so... You so you so now you're playing. You're kind of in the uh, you're in the sabotage family of 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 bands. Yeah. And then you know, speaking of Tommy Vexed. Yeah. So how did you get involved with Tommy for the Westfield Massacre stuff? Yeah, this is a lot more recent. Uh, because I was in LA, I was you know trying to find people to play, but and, and not to talk shit, but, but it's like what a lot of people want to do in LA is not what I want to do. And it, and it doesn't pay enough to do it as how many Hold on. Here's what I want to know. How many cock rock 80s bands asked you to be in their band? Uh, what? How, did any like, did any like. Oh, like co- from the big ones? Like 80s bands. Did any of those bands ask you to be in the band? The if, if you think the second level, not poison level. Like fire, right ha- above, firehouse? Or like right, a, right below probably every single one. Well, by the way, I saw your <laughs> list of, of yeah. influential bands or influential yeah. albums. And I, I have this here. Yeah. Uh, Winger in the Heart Dude, of the Young. I love that album. That's so thing. I don't much. know nothing about Winger except that so the much. dude who was on Beavis and Butthead wore it. And Kip Winger is just a just a beautiful man, just a handsome. You know, what I'm, I'm not gay. He he. But if he, I had to hang out with a guy, it'd probably be Kip. His Winger. orchestral album was just nominated for a Grammy. He writes he writes classical music. Listen, Kip Winger you know, apparently Kip Winger kicks does. acid life, yeah. all right? And, and and Rab Beach, the guitarist, is one of my favorite guitarists. You know, he plays with the he is really good at tapping. He's in White Snake now with Joe Hoekstra, which is the guy I play like I kind of feel in for in Trans Siberian Orchestra. Yeah. But Winger, I mean, dude, that album has it's part of the albums that changed my life. On that same list you might find Danger Danger. Which is also an '80s band. These are actually from New Jersey. Yeah. Skid Row is from New yeah, Jersey. Dude. Um, One of my favorite bands too is Skid Row. So we we oh. know all about it. Like in, right now in New Jersey, there's still people with big teased out hair. You mean like here and, in LA? And like, no, this is. I'm just saying. It's like I'm saying people. Yeah, I guess there's kind of a a through line there. Yeah. But at, you know, New Jersey knows what's up. All right, when it comes to hair metal. That's cool. But anyway, so yeah. so so. So, uh, so you you were looking for di- different people to play with. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't want to be in any of the bands that uh, that were around here, and uh, and I, I got hooked up with Dave Aguilera. You know him, right? Yep. And for management, and he was managing Tommy at the time too. And he's like, "Why don't you guys get together and write some music?" Now he 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 met. It was it was Tommy and Tim at the time. Tim Young. And he was like, well, it's going to be Divine Heresy. You know, I really like the Divine Heresy album. You know, He's like, well, can you write something like this? Up to that point, well, I guess I toured with Vital Remains before that. But other than Vital Remains, I had never played anything that heavy. You yeah. know? So I was like, I listened to the, the Divine Heresy album and wrote like two songs. And Tommy liked them. And we, we just started collaborating. So can you, know? you just... Now, I, I would characterize you as a five-tool... Uh, he, you know, guitar player, heavy metal musician. In that, you you can write, you can play rhythm, you can do leads. You're a great performer, and you understand the the image side of things. You know, I just kind of made up those five points on the spot right now. I don't know. If that- but those <laughs> are the five things you should have. But no, no. <laughs> but but just being because think about it. There's a lot of people who can shred, but they can't write. There's a lot of people who can play rhythm, but they're not good at solos, mm-hmm. vice versa. There's some people who can write and shred, but they kind of look, they don't look the part. They look like they should be playing in their bedroom. Yeah. And, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and I think all that stuff is, is I, I don't know. It, I've seen a lot of the stuff you'll post, I think, kind of talking, speaking to the problems you see mm-hmm. with musicians out there. This is this is something I actually went through your Facebook and tried to find one of the the Bill Hudson rants where you kind of talk about what's pissing you off and what's I but there's so much kind of backlog <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't find a a good one but what's your philosophy I guess on what what you think what do you like if you were to give someone uh some advice who's trying to do what you do what, mm-hmm. what would you say that they should be doing or or what they should not be doing yeah well 
times change, and I think some of these things don't apply anymore to the market. First of, f first of all, the look thing. I don't know that the new bands have a look. You know what I mean? The newer bands, and, and I'm talking about the, the, the newer, the 20, 22-year-old bands, or even the peripheries, like, well, what the, is their look? You know? It depends, I think, which, which band. I think in a lot of ways, that sect, it's like very kind of clean cut. You know, so a guy um, like me couldn't be in a band like that. So things are changing. It would, you like, know, for I don't know. I think there's that prog kind of smart guy. You know, middle class. But see, you know, has, last time I heard, dude, prog was Dream Theater in the images and words. You know. Yeah, but guess who periphery toured with Dream Theater? It, it, but but they had the look, the, the the metal look that these newer bands don't have. That's why that's why I mean that that I don't know that the things that I that I believe in still apply. You yeah. know, I, th I think it's a new market now. But, okay, now to me, what's important is you have to always be better than everybody else. Otherwise, you won't get the job. I mean, just you as know? an individual player. Uh, as, as everything. As, as like, okay, I'll give, I'll give you, I'll, I'll tell you what, what made me stop drinking and what made me basically... Because my career, dude, up to 2012 is bullshit. 2012 is when things started picking up because that's when I stopped drinking. And yeah, that was, the, that was the pivotal point. Yeah, and because and, I went to do an audition for that guy. And the oh, I know guy who, who, I know who got the job. And I looked at him and I'm like, why? I mean, I destroyed that audition. And then I, I'm like, come on. But... Guess what? Dude was in shape. Dude looked good. I was a 250-pound piece of shit that was hungover from the night before. I looked at that guy. I heard that guy. And I was like, okay. I got to look the part. Yeah, that's... that's it well, well, sometimes it's not even being in shape, right? Like, yeah. you can be in shape and look good, but just not be the right look. Like, you know, right like look. I, I tried out for this one band when I got out here, and I'm not going to name the band, but if I had a more, like, goth look or mm -hmm. look like I was in Marilyn Manson or something, I probably would have gotten the gig because it had nothing to do with how well I was playing. It just had to, you know, it's like, sometimes you have to remember if you're trying to join someone else's band, it's like getting cast for a part in a movie. That's, that's when I learned that <laughs> lesson, what you just said. Yeah, that they're, this is the story they're yeah. trying to tell and they need the right quote unquote character, <laughs> you know, you need, you know, and, and that's, that's kind of part of it. And this is something I think about uh, getting a little older yeah. and being like, all right, you know, cause listen, you start them years starting to look on you yeah. and then all of a sudden certain jobs, people won't consider you for it. And oh, you, and you have to, you have to think about that. And you know, right now I'm not in the hired gun type phase. I'm busy working on my own yeah, bands yeah. and I've, I have other project that, that I was quote unquote a hired gun for, but I'm kind of more in the band now. Yeah. And it's, I, I, I realized that maybe the hired gun thing isn't totally for me, that I'd rather either create something or just be really picky. You know, I, right. like, I, I was wondering, I was like, I don't know if I could actually be in a band where I didn't love the music. Let's say either I need to love the music or love the people, but more than likely both. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, um, when I had that realization that you are basically, a, you know, a cast, like you said, I was like, okay, well, the first thing I have to do is I got to get in shape. Now, how am I going to get in shape if I drink so much? I got to stop drinking, you know? So that's that. But stop. I stopped drinking to try to get in shape so I wouldn't lose another audition for looking like shit. You know what I mean? So yeah. that was the thinking behind it. But then um, I started realizing how much other musicians lacked this or that you know like i said you have to be better than everybody else like you have to play better first of all playing should be should be like playing well playing fast being technical that's these days that's the bare minimum you know like you can't impress anybody playing fast shit anymore everybody can do that you know, I'm not that fast, <laughs> but you can do you can you can play Marty Friedman, right? Like kind of. Yeah, you know, I've seen you play Tornado Souls. Eh, I can See? I can I can kind of play it. I, I don't know. I I I always say I'm I'm like a thinking of me when it comes to guitar, like a fighter who is 
who is not like they like it's only on that day mm-hmm. that they can do the fight. Like I have to work my when it comes to okay. very when it comes to very technical lead playing, I actually have to work up to it. Like if I I'm the kind of guy like if you just hand me a guitar, yeah, I'll kind of blow it. Like I need to like warm up. <laughs> I need to you know it depends on what it is you yeah. know. But I I consider myself to be more of a, a like I think I'm a A plus rhythm guitar player, and I'm all about. You know, I, there's a lot of things I do. You know, I can I can sing background vocals. I can do I can I can play leads, and I and I feel like I'm a really good lead guitar player. But I wouldn't say I'm the greatest lead guitar player. I'm kind of someone who can do. I'm a jack of all trades. Yeah. And probably the the primary thing I do uh, is I'm a great listener. So I'm I'm very good at matching tones. So let's mm-hmm. say you have a band that has a lot of different sounds. I pay a lot of attention to that stuff. And I'm also I think like a a band director. So when I'm in the room or working with the band, I'm listening to everyone and I'm making sure, all right, that doesn't sound right, man. That groove isn't really dropping. Sounds like we're a little out of tune. All right, let's work on. So that that's something I bring to, to the band because here's the thing. There's people like you who have been practicing shredding for years. And so I'm never going to be able to outdo you at what you do, right? Like there's a certain gigs that you're going to fit for way better than I will. But I also feel like you know, I could pl- like if you know Kendrick Lamar he's a guitar player. I think I'm gonna get that gig twenty times over all these like Hollywood shredder dudes that you right. know look like they should be in you know uh, you know Poison or something. <laughs> so or some guy that looks like he should be in Marilyn Manson. So it's really I feel like I have kind I of I hate that by the way. What all these guys that look like Marilyn Manson? What's that? Well, there's <laughs> there's there's, there's definitely <laughs> some of that. You know, I I I, I don't even know what the LA thing is, I think, you know, as, in terms of original bands, there's, you know, most of the bands, it seems like are older, you know, like, mm-hmm. it, like where, I don't know where are the, where are the 20 year olds? They're probably playing some basement, you know, or some backyard party, you know, or they're being you know, DJs and making money. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to say, you know, um, in a way, I guess it's a, it's a little discouraging. I think sometimes the LA scene for me feels you know, sometimes, you know, go to like ultimate jam night, you know, for those who don't know, this is, there's like this jam that happens on Tuesdays at the whiskey Mm -hmm. and it's all these professional musicians and they come and they do cover songs and it's really great, but it's also very much of a certain time. So it's, it's very much lives in the seventies and the eighties and me, the way my brain works is I'm like, what's okay. That happened. Mm -hmm. That's done what's what is what is happening here that is looking forward and is thinking about all right yeah we have this great history and we, yeah we all love uh you know van halen and aerosmith and acdc and led zeppelin it's, that stuff is great but guess what it's done they're pretty soon all those bands are going to be gone acdc is mm-hmm. going to hang it up uh, Van Halen's gonna hang it up. Metallica one day is gonna hang it up. As sad as that that makes me, um, and I look at it this way: Are we investing in the future of our of rock music and heavy music? And I and it's and I that's the thing I worry about is not now, but ten years from now, fifteen Dude, years from now. And I hate to I hate to say this, but I this is something that's been in my head almost daily for the past few months. Is this? As a kid, okay, as a, and, and I'm talking about the perspective of a, of a 12, 13-year-old kid today. When you tell them, you know, you can practice all these years to learn to do all these little moves with your hand that can make this noise, or you can make your computer make the same noise. On the kid perspective, that's a waste of time. You yeah. know what I mean? Because these people are brought up in a reality where computer music is real and it's there. So it's not like it used to be like, oh, you know, this band has electronic elements. Well, everything is electronic now. Everything is computer music. Everybody can record on a computer. So I, I think it's very, very unlikely that music, even played by instruments, will last very long, man, because it, 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 there is no... And 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 I, I'm not I'm not gonna talk shit because it's I don't I I don't do that but like wh- the, where metal is headed what what modern what people consider modern metal I can't stand that you know I I honestly can and I listen I'm like am I getting old is this the same reaction that my dad well, how, would have how, to how do you? 
I'm 34. Okay, so I'm 36. And I okay. think we, when you hit that kind of mid 30s, yeah, I think you're the what comes around that's new to our to the, your ears starts to sound like it, you you have a difficulty relating to it. Well, well, it, that's the thing. You know, what, I, there's a there's one band in particular that a lot of people talk about. You know, as a band for the future. Who's that? And I listen, I don't want to say the name because I disagree. You say because you don't like them. I don't like them, okay. but no, but but I try to take a critical listen, mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, why? Everybody says these guys are great musicians. They are. The arrangements are great, but I mean, I listened to the song and I picked it up on guitar like this. You know, Dream Theater wasn't like that when I was a kid. You're you saying know? that you were able to figure it out? Yeah, very easily. Is that these that's things, bad? These things, no, but it, it, that's a band that's supposedly so hard to play. You know what I mean? It's I don't this know genre. That, is this, I is don't know, this, but is that... I don't think that's a good metric. It's, no, uh, no, I'm saying the music doesn't appeal to me as in I don't listen to it and I don't enjoy it. Yeah. Then people say, well, it's because it's so technical, you have to get it. Well, oh, I no. see what you're saying. I see what you're no, saying. No, I can pick that up easily. What is it about this music? And there's a ton of these bands, you know what I mean? It's the, I mean, it's, you know what I'm talking about. It's the whole low tuning thing. It's the whole uh, polyrhythm. It's like, these are things I was studying in college 15 years ago. You know, it's yeah. like, it's, it's, why, why are, why is everyone so impressed by this? When, you know, when, I mean. Well, you got to say, it is, it is a moment in time. That's what I mean. Where, where a certain. Am I too old for the moment in time? Well, I mean, I'm, listen, I'm sure there were a bunch of people that said that about the group of bands I came up with, where it was. That's where, where, I wanted, where we yeah. were like doing this. People were like, well, I heard Testament do that 10 years ago. Who cares? That And in a lot of ways that we were kind of paying homage to the original thrash bands and so, stuff like that. So I totally get that. And the that's thing is, what but, I'm afraid but of. But here's the truth. Nobody knows what's next. Nobody. Because I'll tell you what, if someone knew at a label or some manager, they would be on it. And they would, you know, we're in this really odd place. Like I had uh, Mike Gitter from Central mm -hmm. Media on here who worked at Roadrunner and signed all these big bands and you know he didn't want to talk about what was next because he knows it's 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 not you know it, in a way it's it's not fair to put that on him like oh what's next because no one knows we're still like it's one of those things maybe you'll know it when you see it yeah. you know if you walk into some club somewhere and you see a band that's doing something crazy like corn did like when they came out no one ever done that or a band like slipknot when I mean, you ne no one ever you never seen anything like that or you know maybe even as as recently as as some some a band like periphery when they did come out it was like whoa this is fresh this is new um yeah we're we're at work i think everyone's constantly looking for that and the way i look at it and that's kind of the reason why i stopped once i was done with god forbid and the next thing i did wasn't metal because i was like i'm I don't feel like I have the vision for yeah. what's next in heavy music. So I'm going to go do another style, something where I feel like I could contribute something new. Like I feel like for the hard rock genre, my man Vegas Nerve is doing something fresh and interesting. You, um, be, you know, so it's, 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 it's one of those things like as a musician, can we complain about it if we're not the ones contributing it? It's R true. You know? That's that's the thing that I keep hoping, man. I keep hoping that like the bands are getting so low tuned, so heavy, so rah, that somebody will come out with a band that sounds like power metal, like happy choruses, you know, like let's sing songs about being happy. What what are you so angry about? Why is it so? I mean, if, if you one thing I've noticed, you know, I listen to a band like Acacia Strain. I don't know if you know who, who, who they are. I've heard of, but them. just like so tune low, the vocals are so heavy, yeah. and the lyrics are the most bleak and dark and nihilistic. And you're just like, you gotta remember, it just keeps going. It's gonna keep going that way. Like the the new generation always has to outdo the previous one, so they're gonna get heavier and crazier. But what if they don't? What if they say, "Let's do the opposite now"? Well, some people <laughs> will. There's yeah. always there's always that that backlash, you know. Yeah, I don't know. My my ear, man, is just I I you know I grew up on Maiden, on Halloween, on Sabotage. You're a traditionalist. My, my, yeah, my ear, my ear. But even 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 outside of outside of because like I don't listen to modern metal, but I do listen to modern pop. You mm -hmm. know. I listen to a lot of modern pop music that people, you know, like top 40. 
<coughs> and, and and I f I don't know. Uh, I read I read this thing on the internet that that your brain is wired to like certain things, certain repetitions. I yeah. think I'm like that. I like the simplest shit. You know, the yeah. shit that grabs me. Like to, there's a song called Don't You Worry Child by uh, Swedish House Mafia. It's a dance song. Dude, yeah. that's the best song ever written in like not ever written but written in the past <laughs> in the past 15 years well, i gotta it's, check that it, out yeah but, you know it's it's straight up dance you know but the melody the the harmony it's like you know it's simple it's like chords and vocal melody i don't know i, I listen to that although mm -hmm. you know right now with the with the rehearsals is the opposite of that okay. um, well so there's kind of two two more topics on it going on I'll, I'll let you go one i see you're really active on social media mm -hmm. um what's your your thoughts on being you know because in a way you're the at the helm of the bill hudson brand mm -hmm. whatever that that means and it seems that's like what you, i want to do you know but, but you, you you take that really seriously in yeah. terms of promoting yourself and making sure that everything you're working on you in a way you advertise it and right. that you, you you put it out there like, what's your your thought process behind that well, uh, that's why I had that camera going. But the next thing I'm thinking now is I want to do something on YouTube. I, I am 100% convinced that everything in the future, whatever future is left for us, is in social media. You know, I am 100% convinced that. Now, I think YouTube is the new TV. I think that's already a reality right now. Yeah. You know, like. Hey, I watch. That's half of what I watch. It, yeah, me too. You know, it's like the YouTube stars are more famous and richer than the movie stars. Well, so, I don't know if they're richer, know. but they're probably, they might be more well, famous. Well, PewDiePie, PewDiePie is probably richer. That's one guy. You know. That's one guy. Come on. That's still, that's still YouTube, man. You know, would you think that 10 years ago? So the whole social media thing, um, I think I. I think at the level that I'm at in my career, I can handle, well, maybe not all the messages, but I can handle being in, and engaging with people. I, there's not, there's not enough that it, it's too much for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. But at the same time, there's enough traffic that I can keep doing it. You know, so, but, but that's why I want to start the YouTube thing, whatever that's going to be. Because I realized I did at NAM, I did four different interviews, and all four of them asked me about my my Facebook. And I was like, "So, so people are reading what I'm writing." Okay. Well, no, it's it's interesting because because like it's I, beyond music. Well, no, because I look at it's something I think about because if if I wasn't do, doing if I wasn't promoting all my projects mm -hmm. through social media, I probably wouldn't even be on Facebook or even if I was, I wouldn't use it very much. That's me too. Cause I think it's a pretty toxic environment or it can, it can be. And I see what you do and like, I'll see you do a video or a live stream and I'll see how much, uh, attention it gets. Like you have a lot of fans. Yeah. Um, and I just think to, you know, cause I'm dealing with all these different people, who are, aren't as experienced as, as, as you and I, people way younger than us who are working on projects, but then they don't do the work of promoting it. And <laughs> they, they think their work is done once they finish the record or finish whatever product that they, or whatever project they finish, they're like, oh, it's out. And then they like, oh, I'll put it out and it'll go viral. Yeah. And it's like, no, you like, you have, this is, this is the job yeah. is getting up every day and, and hustling whatever it is because people have so much stuff in their face that they're not going to find your stuff unless you put it in front of their face so they can't avoid it you and just said the perfect thing that is the job you have to you have to take it as your full-time job or you know if you have a full-time job as much as you can yeah you know of course. it's not just making the music you have to do everything else and I mean, that's, you know, that used to be the job of the record labels, but, you know, things, since we're now able to do it without them, that is what you got to do, man. You have to promote. And I, I, I don't know. I just feel that social media is so easy. It's right there, you know. It, it, it is, but, the, but the, I, I think the hardest thing to do is, in a way, what the algorithms do is they, if you promote something, if, it, if your post sounds promotional, they limit how many people it reaches. Oh, I didn't know that. So 
Yeah, so they want you to actually pay for that stuff. And they, they don't want you to use Facebook to spam people, essentially. So the key, or I think the hardest thing to do is is posting posting things in a way that is interesting and that it's not just, hey, I'm doing this thing. Yeah. You know, it. You know, I, like, I don't know. It's just, for for me, it's it's not that it's, it's easy to do, but, you know, if I go there and I post the same flyer 10 times, it doesn't do anything because they actually limit. It'll smaller, smaller amount of people will see it. And the people that do see it will be like, dude, stop spamming me, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's a way of kind of presenting materials that you're working on, but also not shoving it down people's throats. And that's yeah, kind of, yeah. there's kind of a balance there. You know, um, and that's something I try and do and think about creatively. You know, to me, social media is creativity. You know, how you do it, the way you word something, the way you kind of yeah. put a piece of, you know, all right, I'll take this video of this thing that I think people will want to see, but then I'll, you, you know, the way you talk about it or whatever information you dispense in there, there is an art to that. And it's, it's you know, something I'm always thinking about because, yeah, when you're, especially when you're taking, you know, you know, I haven't been doing as much high, higher gun stuff kind of like you, but I'm also trying to promote this podcast. I'm trying to promote my new band, mm-hmm. my, you know, my writings and things like that. So it's, you know, trying to find a way to engage people, you know, so it's something I think about a lot. Well, it's sure work. Your podcast is what high charity and all that. You're it's all a, famous it's, now. It's, I don't know about, I don't know about how, fa- how famous I am, but it's, it's done. <laughs> we have, we have some listeners and uh, I definitely appreciate that. So the, actually the last thing I wanted to ask you about is this, I am morbid project uh, because that's what you're doing out here right now. You're rehearsing for that. Yeah. So what is it? Is it just, you're just playing uh Morbid Angel songs with David Vincent just for a few shows or is this actually writing is there is it more is it beyond just playing <laughs> well right now right now I don't think anybody is sure because me and David Vincent we've written music before uh, but death metals uh, it gets death metal you know it, it's not all death metal but it's also not you know uh anything electronic or anything it's like metal it's it's honestly it's a lot like the stuff i wrote for westfield well death you know? listen uh morbid angel is my all-time favorite death metal band domination is my favorite i think it's the best death metal album of all time i know Ooh. some people say you know i don't consider carcass death metal so i don't i don't put them in, mm-hmm. in there i put the melodic death metal but mm-hmm. but that's my so i have a a, a huge affinity for the david Vincent era of, okay. that, of, the, of that band, so I'm I'm a big fan. Yeah, this I mean this the music that we wrote is metal, but it's not death metal. But then, well, that com- so there's a chance that'll come out under the I Am Morbid tag. Oh, uh, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know what they want to do about that because I, I've read some interviews where he says that he wants to do more stuff. Right now, we're rehearsing songs from the first four Morbid albums. You know, it's me, him, Tim Young, and Ira Black. And we're going to do some shows in South America, which is cool because we're actually playing my hometown. And what? I was just making sure Domination was in there. Yeah, yeah, A, B, C, D. Well, because, so, God forbid, did a show with Morbid Angel in 1998. And we were like a local band. We sold tickets. It was them, Incantation, and Vader. And it was like the craziest day of our lives. Mm-hmm. But uh, Steve Tucker was in the band, and they didn't play anything from domination because uh, i guess at that time they were like hating on that record or whatever but that was my favorite album i was really are you guys playing uh what is that eyes to see we are <laughs> that album dude we are playing that yeah all right don't fuck it up i'm, I'm gonna come rehearsal you sh- i was just gonna say you should man i'm gonna go We're there and tell it. motherfuckers who's fucking up <laughs> i'm like yo man that's not the note there tighten that up you know what i love about the, uh <laughs> That album it are the planned, or, or maybe it's not planned, but the, the tasteful use of feedback, where it's like t- not tight on purpose. <laughs> I like that. That I don't know. I think that's <laughs> just... Dude, it's, it's fucking cool, man. It's, it's, they're the, I think that, uh, the approach that that band took with the, like the, for the guitar tone, for example, like no death metal band ever had that guitar tone. I yeah. think it was a Marshall 900 with like a rat pedal or something. 800. It was 800? Yeah. Okay. 
We're, I've been playing with a with a camper, and first thing David says is, oh, "Why don't we plug in your JCM?" And I'm like, "Oh, let me use the camper just a little bit." And now he likes it, but he he really wants. Well, the to camper. Do the here's what I say with the camper. It sounds. I have one. It sounds great through the PA because you take the direct line. But when you run it through a cabinet, it to me in the room it doesn't sound. It doesn't quite, sound- quite as good there, but. If you're doing a show and you're, you know, and they're yeah. they're taking the line coming out of the PA, it's fucking unbelievable. Yeah. Man. But um. But yeah. But yeah, we, I've been rehearsing with one. It's been it's been great. But yeah, we're just playing, you know, classic Morbid Angel songs, and uh, we're, we'll do these shows and see what happens. It's having it, it, it's cool to play that stuff with Tim because I, ne- I had never played extreme music with Tim like that. Yeah. It's like a machine. It's like a computer. You can program <laughs> the beats. And no, all about Tim, he doesn't play. practice. He just shows up and he just knows it. Yeah. Well, that's what he said today. He texted me. He said, I haven't really played my drum since we did the last field tour. I'm like, dude, that's two years ago. You know? Well, he's been doing, he'll do like <laughs> jam night and jam stuff night, like that. Yeah. You know, we did, we actually did a thing. We did Megadeth. Uh, we did uh, oh, Holy yeah. Wars. And it was fucking sick. It was, was awesome. Cool, man. Well, anyway, man, uh, you have anything you need to promote? Anything you want to talk about before we before we sign off? You guys should go and check me out on Facebook. Uh, no, yeah, facebook.com slash Bill Hudson GTR. Actually, all social media, Twitter, Instagram, and all that is same thing. Bill Hudson GTR, and my official website is www. You don't know your own website? This is embarrassing. Bill <laughs> BillHudsonOfficial.com. Yes. All right. It's brand new, man. I haven't done much. What there. about this this power metal project? Is this going to come out anytime soon? Oh, yeah. Dude, yeah, man. I'm, I'm, I'm doing... Can I'm we doing, talk about it? That? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing a power metal project. Uh, I want to bring back like the not, mid-90s power metal sound, but not in a cheesy way. Like If it's not cheesy, it's not good. That's dude, what's the, it's, supposed to be good about power like, metal, right? My lyrics are not about dragons, first of all. You right. know, it, it, it's the, like are the lyrics. Any sorcery? Themes. No, no. no sorcery? It's, it's um, more like Halloween. It's more like, you know, like we were talking about one of my songs is called Shape Your Reality. You okay. know, like like the stuff that we were this talking about. This is like about. the N.W.A. of power metal. It's about reality, man. Fuck yeah. Talking about what's going on in the streets. We're real. That's right. <laughs> we're fucking, we're motherfucking is there real. A name, is there a name for it? Not yet, no. And a lot of songs came out from uh, from the sessions for my solo album. Because I'm also trying to do a solo album. What were you trying to do? There is no try. Well, uh, When is the Bill Hudson, all right, so we're announcing here, the Bill Hudson <laughs> solo album will be out very soon. Very soon. Right? But I've been saying that for like seven years. Well, get on. Well, things I know you, you you're a writing machine, so I, I can't imagine. But that. I, I write songs with vocals. Like I said, I you're like not, simple melodies. So, I, I'm I'm uh, I don't know. In my guitar stuff, just sounds like uh, I don't like it very much. I I have a couple songs I you like. You just get kind of bored with the instrumental. Yeah, shred. yeah. But but then I I go back and I listen to Ingve and I'm like I I can't you know. But didn't he had a singer though? that's the thing you know I end up doing an album that's half singing and half instrumental do that what's wrong yeah. with that you yeah, know? That's, you, that's, there's no rules man to a solo record <laughs> that's kind of where it is right now uh, but but this power metal project kind of came from that you know it's songs that started as instrumental and then took, took a shape of their own um <clears throat> I have a couple of people that I'm talking about, uh, talking to about being in the band, but right now it's just me, you know, and uh, I, I had a singer record some stuff for me. Not quite sure that's the right singer. So if you're interested in power metal and you're a singer, let me know. And you're, Get a hold of me. And you're done with Westfield? You're not doing anything really? I, I, honestly, I don't know, man, because uh, I talked to Tommy just the other day. Uh, I'm not in the band. No, I'm yeah. not as a part of the band. I might write some music for the new album. Kind of have to wait and see. Uh, yeah, we can't. We we haven't decided. I'm working with Ira too with the morbid thing, you know. Right on. So I mean, it, there's always a relation. So, so so here's the thing. I I looked at at Bill's uh, bio and he has played in all the bands and he will continue. Um, he to me he's an inspiration. The fact that he he went from living in a foreign country to now he he plays in tri, Trans Siberian Orchestra, one of the biggest bands in america not just the big, biggest uh metal bands and you know he's to me he's proof that you can if you really want it you're willing to work for it and you and just that positive oh the positive energy you can do this shit so thanks for coming on brother thank you for having me man
That song was called EGO or Ego, and that's by Bill Hudson. I wanted to show you guys some of his playing in case you hadn't hadn't heard him. And uh, he wanted me to reiterate that that was a, a demo track. He has very high standards for the stuff he puts out there, but definitely want to thank Bill so much for coming on. I think his his story, his career is extremely interesting and also just impressive. You know, it's one of those guys I'm like, damn. A guy, he's he's out there and he's he's really doing it. So huge thanks to Bill. Uh, definitely, again, thank you guys. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, if you can and you have the time, please go on iTunes, leave a comment, leave a rating. It helps out. Again, I'm not going to go this long between next episodes. I got to get to work. I got to make this stuff happen. I have so many people I want to talk to. Uh, people I have I have been in talks with about getting some episodes done, and definitely want to expand the circle of the people and not, you know, and really get out to people in different genres of music and not just the kind of small kind of circle of, of metal people that I've been talking to recently. So I want to keep going with that and uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Anyway, guys, thank you guys for listening. Mamba out.